All right, we are in our second to last session of, of Philippians, and I, I have to say that I uh, am a, bit of a, a little ashamed of myself in having read so many times this letter and just read it, but not really listened to it. And over the course of these past several weeks, um, I've, I've really fo obviously focused to prepare and study this letter rather than just read this letter. And this letter contained far more than, than ever I anticipated, and I hope it has been that way for you as well. That, that, and Paul's not done, and we're, we're going to break four into two parts uh, this week and next week. Uh, and the next week is, is, to a great degree, the kind of the salutation, the goodbye. Uh, and it's, the, it's not goodbye, 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 goodbye is, is 2 Timothy, but goodbye is goodbye to the Philippians. Uh, in uh, in this letter. So as we begin, uh, I have a, a series of conversations every week, uh, good friend Ray and, and with Brad, and, and I had two particularly good conversations this week, one longer than the other. And, and the second one, Ray had sent me a a uh, quote from, e. M., I believe it was E.M. Bounds, either E.M. Bounds or A.W. Uh, Tozer. If you've never read any E.M. Bounds or A.W. Tozer, you'll want to read some E.M. Bounds and A.W. Tozer if you want to read those two. They're really, really good. Uh, men to, to listen to. And the quote that Ray sent me from Ian Bounds was, in an effort not to err in salvation by works, we have invented a salvation without obedience. That was a, just, now, I'm a sucker, a total sucker for... It was Tozer. Was it Tozer? Thank you. I see, I sent Ray a text this morning saying, which one, which, which one of these guys said that? And he didn't respond to me. So you, so you heard it was Tozer. Okay, it was Tozer, not Bounds. It sounds so bounces to me, uh, but it was Tozer. Okay, so Tozer said it. Um, uh, I'm a sucker for for these dispil, distilled word craft that are are just rich in their form, but this is also rich in its theological import. And to some degree, that uh, even though that didn't come until Thursday this week retroactively it just began to kind of reframe all of my, my preparation this week. And so uh, uh, hold on to that thought that in an effort not to err in the salvation by works, we may have invented a salvation without obedience. And part of what Paul will lead us in here has to do with that commitment to obedience. And it's not as much obedience in what we do, even though he's going to he he will approach that. It's also the obedience in how we think, how we frame our minds. So as we get started this morning, I had to ask Skip this morning because I didn't hear him close this last week. If he did or he didn't, I don't remember. But I, I didn't hear him close this last week with, "Oh, by the way, chapter four is this kind of mind." And uh, so Skip has offered us the framework of the secure mind for the closing chapter of. Philippians. Okay. And uh, I, I had to, to kind of debrief with him really quick here uh, because there are two really popular phrases, Bible verses from this chapter that we hear a lot. Uh, one of them has to do with the peace that passes understanding if we use, the, if we use the, kind of the, more the King James translation. And the other one is that um, I can do all three things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, well, honestly, that second one will be a part of our, our study next week, but the first one will be a part of today. Now, uh, this, uh, this thought of, of the peace that passes understanding uh, has a great deal to do with how Skip has helped us with this framework of the secure mind. However, I'll just kind of let the cat out of the bag on the front end. I'm not going to spend as much time in that particular part of this uh, uh, first half of chapter 4 because we hear that a lot. And honestly, I'm listening a whole lot closer for me to what Paul's saying to us uh, that maybe I've missed. And so I've really focused on things that I probably have missed rather than things that I'm a little more familiar with here. So as we get started, last week, uh, a lot of what we had to talk about is, is how you think. And this week, a lot of what we're going to uh, look at here this morning is what you do with what you think. And that's why the Tozer quote was so important to me. Okay, so as we get started, uh, there's a we we put chapter and verse into this. Obviously, we all remember that 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 the, the divine hand of God did not put chapter and verse into this. Uh, well, maybe inadvertently he did, but but 
it, it wasn't written that way, it wasn't scribed that way or pinned that way initially. That was the chapter and verse division was added to it. And if you're a student, you'll see that that the first verse of chapter four, contextually and in terms of its content, belongs to content that actually shows up back in chapter three. Right? So uh, if, if, if we allow chapter and verse to structure how we think about what we read, uh, that may be a little confusing. So I, I wanna, I wanna re-tie it back to chapter three. So as we start, therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for joy and my crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friend. Now, this is for me, again, conversationally, I'm saying what? What is it? I missed it. What? Well, that is how you should stand firm. What is the that? That? How is it that I should stand firm? Did I miss it? Well, if I'm really looking for chapter 4 to be a little more contextually bound, then I'm not going to find it. Where I'm going to find the answer to the question, what is the that that is how I should stand firm, is actually back up in 3. And it is in the close of 3, which we really did not focus on last week, which because we just simply ran out of time. So I want to walk us backwards for a second in kind of three steps. The first step starts at verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await the, uh, the Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord. That's the first part of your answer is to of the that. The that is, is that you have a citizenship and a likeness. Did you catch that in what he said? And from verse... Uh, um, is it just 20 or 20 21? It's just 20. You have a citizenship and a likeness. Your citizenship is not of this world. Your citizenship is of heaven. You just temporarily live here. Remember, you have a temporal body uh, and an eternal soul. You are fundamentally an eternal soul. That You just have a temporary body. You are not a body that has a soul. You are a soul that has a body. And that's what Paul is, is focused on here, is to say in, in, a, in different terms. And that is, you, your citizenship is not of this world. Your citizenship is of heaven. You are born again. You have a new allegiance. You allied yourself or pledged your allegiance to a new flag. There's a new piece of real estate that is now your home. It was not your home before your salvation. Leonard Ravenhill said, Another good one to read. <laughs> a time on earth is just a dressing room for heaven. A dressing room for like that because you're going to get that garment. <laughs> yeah. No, like, it, it, Raven Hill's another great one. If you've not read any Leonard Raven Hill, that's another really good one to read. Okay. Um, and then the second part, and uh, oh my gosh, this is this that the Raven Hill quote works really well with it. It's not that you have a, 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 a citizenship born of your salvation. You also have a, a likeness that you are being converted into. Now, in the fullest picture, that you are being restored to. You were born perfect. You fell, and you are being restored to the perfection in which you were created. And so, uh, to, to, to really buy into the Raven Hill quote, uh, you're in that dressing room. You're getting that new robe, that, that robe that makes you fit to be one that will not pollute heaven. Uh, so uh, now I'm crossing Raven Hill and, and uh, what's his name out of Atlanta or Pennsylvania? I forget his name all of a sudden. What's his name? Gosh, uh, Barnhill. Uh, Barnhill and Raven. Oh, they're both hills. Okay, so we get, get easily distracted here. So that's what Paul's saying. Now, when he gets to, but your citizenship is in heaven, that but also links us back up. That links us back up to all of us who are mature should take such a view. Now, this is where we got into last week, and we asked, well, well what's that view we would take? How, so we go from, how do I stand firm, this is how you stand firm, to what is the view that equips me to stand firm? And the view uh, goes back up to, I gain, I lose everything that I thought was of value in this world, and I count it nothing more than rubbish, and that I gain... There's, I gained that maturity that is in the single-mindedness of Christ. So, so if we go back all the way up where Paul to, to get to where Paul is in 20, 
I'm cutting loose of everything that was distracting me of this world. I have gained the, the single-mindedness of Christ. And now in that, I stand firm until the day of his coming as one who now thinks mature. Yeah, me, maybe you get all this in just a, a reading of the letter. I don't know. I, this, this, this has to be beaten into me. It takes a long time for me to, to actually come to where Paul's at, understand what Paul's telling me. I much too easily kind of read over these things when I'm just reading. So Paul's kind of drugged me <clears throat> up to this point where uh, the first verse of chapter 4 gets linked back into 3 as, a, as a, not a completion of the idea, but the continuation uh, and, a, and a crescendo of that part of the idea. So if we get that far, uh, we want to make sure that we, that we now think in terms of there is a way... Uh, it's easy to put it this way. Um, we live as beings that are agencies with actuaries. And I, and, and, and I, don't, I don't know how to distill it better than that. As an agency, you are a person. As an actuary, you have the ability to exact what you think as a person. Uh, think of it as a, a, a free agent with an ability to exercise his will. You, un you understand the, the distinction? Uh, the, the, the opposite is determination, that you are not free. That, that everything that you do is preordained, foreordained, uh, and that all you're doing is just walking through the uh, the foreordained content of your life, and that your actuary, how you act, what you do with what you think, is all part of the same package. It's all planned out ahead of time. It's all scripted. That that's that that is determinism. Now what? Paul is what Paul describes here in all of this is something largely very different than that. What he's saying is, is that, that you have a will, an agency, and you have the ability to, to decide or act upon what you think. And so we're going to see that unfold here in a minute. But we'll start with I plead with you though, and I plead with can anybody pronounce that one? Yodia. Huh? Yodia. Oh, no, no, I get Yodia. Um, but uh, the second one, S-Y-E. Huh? Syntyche. Syntyche. Very good. Thank you. Syntyche. Um, I plead with, uh, with Yodia, and I plead with Syntyche. Do you agree with each other in the Lord? And yes, I ask that you loyal your fellow, help these women who have contended at my side for the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, I want to stop there for a second because there's two, pl two things that I'd like to to uh, illuminate. One is um, loyal yoke fellow. Now, uh, do we, any of y'all have conversations where you use the word yoke fellow? <laughs> I mean, does that one come up? I mean, you're just kind of casually talking over, you know, dinner and you use the word yoke fellow. No, that didn't, that didn't happen much. Yoke fellow is kind of a tough word for us, and I think it's really important for, for Paul to have used the word that he used. And it's, it's if I pronounce it right, uh, syzygous. The Greek word that he uses, Sisygus. Now, Sisygus is a, a, a kind of a comp, more of a, of a less of a translation and more of an idea. And the idea is that it is that it is two independent agencies who act in one mind. And so, where yoke fellow comes is it's from the idea of the yoke of oxen, where there's a yoke stretched across, stretched across the shoulders of two oxen who are of one mind or of one task who do the work that is greater than the work of one. And so the, the bond between the two oxen yields the increased capacity for the oxen to work. Now that's the idea that Sisygus has. It is two independent forces that link together of one mind, one spirit, one intent, one will for the purpose of achieving a common goal. And so when 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 we use the word Sisychus, yoke fellow is about as close as we get. I know we have to grab an animal uh, 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 parallel here for that, or, or a euphemism for that. But what he's talking about is these two ladies, they were once bound of one mind and of one will and of one purpose and of one goal. And now there's a division between them. And, and we don't have any idea what the division is. There, there's no indication at all what it is. Uh, but it doesn't take too long, and you don't have to live in, the, in, in any congregation anywhere 
to know that there are divisions in the church. Sometimes they're petty. Sometimes they're uh, uh, unfounded based upon the pride and the, and the independent will of individual congregants. Sometimes they're over rich, important, fundamental theology. And you really, before you get in too much of an argument, you need to determine which it is. Well, these two ladies are, are, are struggling right now. And Paul's saying, uh, they are yoked all. And they contended with me. So he endorses who they are and what they did. Don't wipe them under the table just because of the rift between them. You know, honestly, since we kill our dead really quickly in the Christian church, it's really easy for us to say, those who are the, the muckrakers, they just got to go. Rather than help these ladies come back together, find that common ground, be there. I, I, I remember, I don't know if I read it or just thought about it, but, but what Paul's saying is, is, I'm not there to help, but I don't have to be because you're there to help. So you go to work, you do the hard work, you roll up your sleeves, you get into these ladies' lives and help them find that common ground again and place them back in that, that structure of yoke fellowship, if I can actually extrapolate that word from it. Because there's a really important reason why you need to do this. And it comes in the next part of this. These women who have contended by my side and the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of the fellow yokers whose names are in the book of life. Guys, these two ladies, their names are in the book of life. Don't discount. Don't discard. Don't let it fester. Do the hard work of investing in the lives of your brothers and sisters in Christ to, to reunite broken bonds. Don't sweep it under the rug because it's just those hard conversations to have. And why? Because their names are in the book of life. Now, for some of these new young Christians, in Philippi, a Roman retirement city for the military, and they not know what this, this, this book of life thing is. That, you know, there may be some euphemistic kind of poetic things to say about it, but they may not realize what Paul was saying. Some of us may not either. Does the book of life sound familiar? You, you've heard this before? Where have you heard about the book of life before? Revelation. Revelation? It's in the tree. And the tree in Genesis. And then there's a really good link that I'm going to go to in just a second there from Revelation, which is, I think, interesting. But the others? Actually, there are, are several. And this is not just New Testament. This is, as Linda pointed out, this is Old Testament too. And it doesn't come just from Genesis. It comes from other parts of the Old Testament. So this idea of the book of life, is, is one of those really strong fundamental tendencies of our faith that we should get a good handle on. We shouldn't just read that, oh, by the way, these two ladies, their names are in the Book of Life, and then go on to the next verse. We should stop and ask, well, what are we talking about when we're talking about the Book of Life? Now, Linda also uh, uh, noted the Tree of Life. Now, the, the Tree of Life in, and the Book of Life uh, in uh, Malachi, the Scroll of Remembrance, uh, the Lamb's Book of Life, these are all languages that are describing the same fundamental thing. Now, if we if we read all of the, the references to the Book of Life, Tree of Life, Lamb's Book of Life, Scroll of Room, we remember we read all these, we come to a very similar kind of body of thought about what this is. And one uh, and included in that body of thought, which I'm not I'm not an expert on this, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best. And if somebody else has a better handle on this, please uh, uh, voice uh, voice this. Uh, first, to, to, to Linda's point, if we go to Revelation 20, 15, what we find is, is that, that, um, that his part will be taken away from the tree of life. And, this, and uh, we won't run there right now, it's okay. But some translations will say book of life, some will say tree of life. And that was a, a, an, a, an odd uh, translation error that was made in Erasmus translation, and this is this is fun for me, so I'm just going to go on this branch and then I'm coming back really quick. In Erasmus translation, from Greek to Latin, lingo, L-I-N-G-O, means tree, libro, L-I-B-R-O, means book, and the translator wrote lingo, tree, rather than libro, book. And it was corrected later on. But that stood for a long time. His part will be taken away from the tree of life rather than his part will be taken away from the book of life. Now, that's just, an, that's just more of an aside here. If we go to Exodus, we talk about the book of God. 
If we talk to Malachi, we talk about the scroll of remembrance. If we go to Revelation 13, 8, we talk about the uh, Lamb's book of life. And if we go to Revelation and multiple places in, in Revelation, we talk about the book of life. One of the things that you want to pay attention to in all of these definitions, because you'll see it throughout, is that the names will be struck from. And that's important. That's important to see. Because the book of life is literally that. It's, it, it, whether, whether you think of it as a text or just an accounting, either way, or a scroll, because it was spoken of as a scroll. Scroll, text, accounting, book, however you think of it. It is the, the accounting of all lives that God created. And from those lives, which God would that all men be saved, God created all people in his likeness and image. These are the souls, all souls that are created. Yet those who will be condemned by their refusal of God, their names will be stricken from this book of life. The book of life is not a book that is blank by which the saved names are added to it. It is the book of all lives, the opportunity for all to be saved. And at which point God determines that you are unwilling to receive him, his son, then your name is stricken from the book of life. Do you see the distinction there? And Paul, what Paul's saying is, I'm letting you know a little secret ahead of time, guys. These two ladies that are struggling right now, that I'm pleading with you to help find their place back together again. What you're talking about is not just miscellaneous rabble rousers in the congregation. What we're talking about is two women who have all are for not foreordained, but foreknown by God to be in the book of life. Hold fast to these ladies and do the work within your congregation. Have those hard conversations. Handle carefully the lives of other people. This is uh, Skip probably knows this better than any of us. Um, uh, one of the supernatural gifts that God places in someone whom He's called to pastoral leadership is he's given that man a supernatural ability to carefully handle the life of another person. To handle the life of another person as God handles the life of his creation. And that's what Paul's calling these guys to do. Do the hard work. Handle carefully this life. Think as God would think. Think as Christ would think. That's what we've been talking about all this time. Is about becoming renewed in your mind to be the kind of people who will think as Christ sees, who sees the world as Christ sees the world, who sees another human being and sees the world. And when you see these two ladies, do the hard work, invest in them, and strengthen them, restore them, not just not to the church, but to each other, the fellowship, the yokemanship of those who will contend in Christ. Now, he almost it's, it's, that's almost a, an oh-by-the-way type thing. Because if we take verse 1 of 4, that really belongs with chapter 3. Uh, we get into uh, chapter 4, which I'm going to say starts at verse 2 in chapter 4. And it's an almost a no by the way. Because then he'll immediately go to rejoice in the Lord and uh, always. And I will say it again, rejoice. And let the gentleness be evident in you all. The Lord is near. Now, it, it, just as an aside, the Lord is near. Uh, that, that language will be used in, in, in multiple different uh, context that principally say the same thing. It's not just that the Lord is near by spirit. His Holy Spirit dwells within you. The Lord is near. It is the time of the Lord <coughs> is near. So when Paul says this, he's saying that you need to live your lives under the understanding that the time of the Lord is near and that the, the presence of the Spirit is within you. So you, you would want to think about it in both ways when he says this. Uh, I, I put a little note in, in my book that it just says present and future. This is how you live for the present and knowledge of the future. Okay. So um, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request before God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now I want to I want to take that in kind of two parts. And part A is the prayer. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request before God. Now, this is another place where one of the longer conversation that I had with Ray this week 
uh, began to really kind of influence what I'm studying here. And, and our conversation centered around this um, uh, verse from Second Chronicles 7.14, I think. I, I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. Is that right, 7.14? Yeah, 7.14. Now, in, uh, if you know the Second Chronicles 7.14 passage, is um, uh, um, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will heal their land. That's pretty close. Did I leave anything out? That's principally. Yes, yeah, seek my face. Yeah, seek my face. Humble themselves, seek my face. Humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Right? Is that, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, honestly, that I, I'm not, I was unfamiliar with that as a, as a, a verse that I remember uh, until several years ago, I was at a Promise Keeper conference, and that was the theme verse for the entire conference. And That's one of the few times where it was a conditional promise. Can you elaborate on that? Because I'd appreciate it. We have to do something before he does something. Now, now, think about that one for a second. We have to, I mean, when you talk about agency and actuary, how you think and what you do with what you think, that, 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 God's telling us, I'm right here with you near, but I need you to come to me. you gotta you got to surrender you in order to come to me. And if you'll do that, and then this is, this is where I want to uh, 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 kind of hone in on this, uh, that what he's saying is, seek my face, turn from your wicked ways, pray. But for the first time in my life, I'm, I'm, I'm having this discussion with Ray, and the operative word, and, and you tell me if you, if, you, if you think this is accurate, the operative word, at least for me, in that passage from Second Chronicles 7.14 was humble yourself, humility. Are, are we, just, just to put it in context here, I don't think Jerusalem was having a hard time praying. I think there's a whole lot of praying going on. In fact, there's probably a whole lot of yak prayer going on in Jerusalem. But God didn't, he, he wasn't discounting that, oh, you guys are not, it's not that you guys aren't full of religious activity, you are. The challenge that we face is, is the posture with which you come to me in prayer. Humility. You'll never seek my face unless you humble yourself before me. Your prayer is full of demand, but not. Of fray. And if you struggle with this, all you have to do is go to the first chapter of Isaiah and read the first chapter of Isaiah from about verse 7 to about verse 24, where God just lambasts them through the voice of Isaiah. They're saying that you know all about the religious activity. You have used your agency as a free will to exercise your will as an actuary, but you turn it into a machine. You come to me, and then you get halfway through that passage. He says, even though you raise your hands and pray to me, I'll not hear you. God is refusing to hear the prayer. And why? It's a lack of humility. You turn it into a machine. You think it's an exchange. You think that you can just give me pieces of what you want to give me, where, and, and, and if I have to go back to Tozer for a second, you have built this salvation without obedience. You've manufactured your own means of approaching me. And uh, this, is, this, uh, this is the verse that draws me to this whole passage of Isaiah the most. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they can be white as snow. God said, it's not beyond you to understand. He's actually giving you the opportunity to use this skill that he's giving you to reason. This is not rocket surgery. You can get this. I created you in a way where you can understand this. So now, come. Come, reason with me. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, they can be white as snow. That, that the distinction from where you are to where I'm calling you to be is within your ability to understand. So focus with me and understand. It begins with humility. That's where Paul is. Uh, that This is where I'm led when we get to this passage with Paul. And if you remember, this is not at all unlike what we just studied in Job, where there was two characterizations of the man Job that were attributed to him by God. And they are the two characterizations of the character of Job attributed to Job by God. And the character of Job attributed to him by God was he was righteous. The two characteristics of that righteousness, God doesn't just give him that title. He defines that title. 
And the two characteristics are that he feared me and he shunned evil. And we do a really good job of fearing God sometimes, but we don't do a very good job of shunning evil. We still manage that in our lives. We still chase evil. As, as noble as I'm, I, 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 I know all of us are, I also know all of us still coddle some measure of evil in our thoughts. I, I know I do. If I'm the only one in here, I'll confess. I am. But I know it's of you too. I don't want to be offensive, but y'all are evil. Not evil. Y'all have evil thoughts from time to time. Um, so that's, that was the characterization that God gave Job. It's the, but we're, it, and, and what was the great charge against Job? Humility. Job, the problem is, is that, that you're a big basket of sin, and the biggest problem is, is you'll know it. You're too proud to, to uh, agree to this. And that's why the three of us are here, to help you understand that your lack of humility is why you're suffering the way you are, and that you're not quite what you think you are. And in God's characterization over him is, no, 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 this is a guy that fears me, and he shuns evil. This is the nature. Humility is the core of our prayer life. And if it is not a part of our prayer life, then we're, we put ourselves in that Isaiah 1 position. God doesn't relegate us to that position. We put ourselves in that position by assuming that the name it and claim it theology is the right way to approach God. Or the healthy, wealthy, and wise, the prosperity gospel. What I'm entitled to as a Christian is the right way to approach God. Those, you know, you cannot, you cannot get into, you, you can't get ankle deep in either of those kind of theological ideas before you run headlong into a lack of humility. It just doesn't exist in those ideas, and that's at the core of where we, what we, where where we have to be when we approach God in prayer. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request before God. He's saying, "Come, please come, ask." Ask, and it will be given unto you. Um, um, seek first the kingdom of God, and all things will be added unto you. He's not in the business of withholding, but he is in the business of humbling. And we must approach him with humble hearts. Now, the reason that I've yacked out all of that, I hope you followed me on that. There's a reason that I've, that I've gone back through Job and uh, back to where I was. is because we cannot take either lightly or as an entitled person. We can't take it as an entitlement that just because we come to church every Sunday and we show up in a Sunday school class and we read our Bible two times a week, that the peace that passes understanding, the peace of God will be with you. That, that doesn't, that's not, that's, not so, that's not something you're entitled to. That is a relational gift between God and those who humble themselves before him. That will approach him based on how he says he's to be approached. And that peace that passes understanding is going to be the peace that passes you by if you don't get that, if we don't get that. Now the second part of this. And the peace of God which transcends understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Now I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna pick up the next verse here because the, the, now we're gonna, we're gonna link. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And again, he has then again reinforced that the God of peace will be with you. The peace that passes understanding, the God of peace both with you. See what you do here. So for me, again, conversational. If I see two bookends, I'm looking for the content between the two bookends. I just saw two bookends. So now I'm looking for the, for the content that is, is shaped or framed by those two bookends. And so I'm going to describe it this way. It's two sides of the same coin. The first part is the guarding your heart in prayer. The second part is the setting your heart on. Now I'm going to, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that. The first part, he says in verse 7, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I won't go into mind there. I hope that's, that this is implicit. I'd like to spend time there, but I think I would just spend the rest of the morning in, in the mind side of that. I'm just going to say that, that when he says the heart and the mind, what he's talking about is both the, the heart, the appetites of your life, uh, and your mind, the will that you have to exercise. That God, the, the peace of God will guard 
both the appetites of your life and the exercise of your will. Okay. But then, he's, then he, he doesn't stop there, though. This is the second side. There's the guard your heart, and then there's the set your heart. Now, this is an act of the will. Don't mistake what he's saying here, that this is a choice that you will make. You have control over making this choice. God has trusted you with the responsibility of making this choice. And that choice is to set your heart. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, anything that is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. This is how you're to focus your mind. And if you, if you struggle with this, I'll just use myself as an example. I think about a billion things all the time. And it's totally across the spectrum. It is really difficult for me to kind of hone in. It's not, not difficult. It's a, dis it's a discipline for me to hone in and stay focused on one particular thing. Because there's a billion things that I'm like totally fascinated with and interested in. And so when it's time for me to focus, I have to discount as much as I can, get out of my head as much as I can in order to get focused. And for me, uh, uh, a warm incandescent lamp, low lit, just enough to read, and uh, there's a particular kind of genre of music in the background that really helps me, and I can, I can engage, I can focus, and I can cast everything else out. And for me, that's, that's part of the discipline of how I, how I uh, uh, segregate the things that I do not want impregnating my thoughts right now and the things that I want to stay focused on. And that's a discipline for me, and it's taken me a long time to get into that discipline. It's not something that just kind of came to me naturally. For some people, it, it, they're, they're much easier. Uh, they can compartmentalize so much easier than that. For me, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle, but I've, I've, I've kind of learned how to do it, at least in my life, to be able to focus. And Paul's saying, this is what I want you to do. I want you to cast out all of those worries, all of those... Um, I remember... Uh, uh, Frank Perret, who was given a, uh, a, a message to a group of uh, teenagers in Canada for a, uh, it was a youth ministry uh, meeting, and he was, he was speaking of a time that uh, uh, he was in a conflict, and uh, he says, I had a great comeback. I mean, it was so great. Three hours later. <laughs> he, he, he had this, this really great answer for this argument that he was in with this guy, and it, but it didn't come until three hours later, and he felt that he was spared from having said something that he would have to repent of later by not thinking of it at the time. But three hours later, his mind is still con his, is still focused on it. It's still distracted by this debate, this argument that he was having with this person, and it's still living rent-free in his head. And so he's not approaching it this way. I'm approaching it this way to say that we can allow those types of historical events in our lives to become hysterical events in our lives. And just rob us of the focus of where our mind should really be. Now, I identify with Frank said because I'm having all kinds of conversations that were never had. I'm, guy, I, I'm, I'm right with him. I get Frank. I've got a thousand really great, clever comebacks three hours later. And I consider myself spared for not having said things that I would have to repent of later. Or backed myself into a corner that I'd rather not be. Or embarrassed myself before my Savior for not living a Christ-like life because of what I was thinking that I shouldn't say. And then you have to back up and say, but why are you thinking that? Because you let it live rent-free in your life. And Paul's saying, don't let all of these distractions pull you away from where you should be focusing, structuring your mind, such that when you think rightly, you do rightly. When the agency of your thought becomes the piety of the actuary of your will. And he's saying, here it is. Focus on what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. <coughs> That's the way you get out of the loop. I'm sorry? That's the way you get out of the loop. Yeah, that's a great way to see. Because I do, I can get myself in a loop. And then I have to just, I, I really do, I have to just pound myself to say, stop allowing that to influence you. The third piece. And I'm talking to myself. I'm not standing in front of a mirror, but I should be standing in front of a mirror when I say that. <laughs> Quit letting that influence you. Focus. 
So it's easy. It's easy to, for that to do that. Yeah, because I want my pound of flesh. You want your pound of flesh? Yeah, you get you get upset about it, and you want your pound of flesh. But asking God to help you get out of that loop and those things that you just read, focus on those things that are holding you. That redirect your focus with the help of God help you get out of those loops. That you got. No, I'm 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 completely in agreement with you. And this is a part of what I consider cultivating your appetite. Now, I'm going to lean on Robbie Zacharias for a minute here. Every one of you all have been, been given the will, the ability, the free reign to cultivate your own appetite. What are you going to cultivate an appetite for? Mm -hmm. The Lord will have, I mean, the world will have the delicacies of the banqueting fair laid out before you. May you and all of it is tasty. All of it. But God says there, there, is, there is food for the body and food for the soul. I want you to focus on the food for the soul. There's still a world of food for the soul that is nothing but empty calories and poison. And yet, we cultivate an appetite for it. We all have. All of us begin. None of us went through our teenage years without cultivating an appetite for the things of the world. But we who are mature should think this way. We who are mature should stand in this manner. It, 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 it doesn't take long to start linking all of the groundwork that Paul invested into us in chapter 3 to get to this point, to be able to say, now you're, now you're prepared to hear what I'm telling you, and what I'm telling you is, is that you must choose, as an act of your will, willfully choose to cultivate an appetite for that which is noble, true, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. And if you will, go to the end, and the peace of, or the God of peace will be with you. Um, there's a, there's a, 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 I'm leaning on Ray a little bit again, too much this morning maybe. Uh, Ray will say that everybody wants the peace of God, uh, uh, but not the God of peace. Mm -hmm. That we, we want the peace that passes understanding. <clears throat> But we don't want to be the kind of people that God calls us to be in order to receive that peace that passes understanding. We want the peace of God, but not the God of peace. And what Paul's saying here, the only way to get the peace of God is to want the God of peace. And the path, as he, as he ends here, the God of peace will be with you. The path to living at peace with God is the renewing of your mind daily. And the structure that he just gave us is the structure of the renewed mind. But again, this is choice. You must choose this. You must choose this appetite. Uh, I, I, I want to make sure that I don't miss. Yeah, okay, good. I'm, Gail's wired your phone at me. I, I, I didn't realize when I was when I was uh, uh, digging into this, and I, mostly my study time is very early in the morning, even though I'm, I'm kind of yapping in my head all day long about this stuff. But the, the focus time is in the morning, and I just ripped right on through and got into uh, 10, 11, 12, and didn't realize, oh no, no, that's going to be for next week. So I'm not going to I'm not going to venture there. But before he gets into the real uh, uh, salutation, the greeting, uh, or the 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 goodbye, uh, he will get into um, this passage that will conclude, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And, I, and we will focus, that's going to be our primary focus next week. Uh, but right now, it's that being before doing. And that's that's where Paul is structuring the life of, he's helping the, the, the young Christians in Philippi structure a life that is at peace with God. And to, to, if I can just, at the very end, grab Skip's word, um, the, the, yeah, the security of your life in Christ. That, that, that Paul is structuring us to be people that actually can see that, can understand that, and can cultivate an appetite for that. So we do have to close this morning. We're gonna we're gonna wrap up our letter of Philippi. I, 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 uh, I to, uh, the, to the Philippians. Uh, I again I I've read this letter a lot of times and just read it, but not studied it. And this has been uh, a, a a great opportunity. For, I hope it's been valuable for you too to slowly walk through 
what Paul's telling us. I'm sure there's loads we've missed, but we're, uh, I thank God for what we have gleaned. So as we close this morning, other thoughts before we wrap up? Paul had a lot to say about controlling your mind in most of his letters. Uh, but he gives the key down there in verse 9, practice. Practice controlling mm -hmm. your mind. Practice controlling your mind. You don't just wake up tomorrow and say, I'm going to control my mind. I'm so glad you said that because four, four, four times in my notes I wrote the word exercise. But practice is it. You're right. Can you elaborate uh, any more on that? I mean, I appreciate you bringing that up. Well, the way I've handled it over the last 25, 30 years is I picture my mind as a room with a door. Mm -hmm. And when those thoughts appear or come to my mind, I just close the door in my mind, mm -hmm. in my thoughts. I can envision, you know, envision it. I close that door and turn away from it. Is that, does that, is that resonant with anybody else? Yeah. As a man think of in his heart, so is he. You can control the thoughts, you can control who you are. You know how to do it. And this, of course, is conjunction with giving God the praise for it. Yeah. Allowing him to do that. It's a, no, it's, do it. it's a sacrifice of praise to, to do that, to execute that. Yeah. Others? I mean, that resonates with me. What Linda's saying resonates with me. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily see it as a room, of, uh, but I, I have a, a very similar discipline in my life, of, of, as uh, the former dean of College of Architecture said, recognizing the illegitimate child and casting it out. When those, when those, when those ideas or thoughts or explorations come into my head, uh, rather than coddle them, I have to recognize them as illegitimate children, and I've got to cast them out. Other things to do. Yeah, I've got other places to focus my mind. The more. Another place to uh, exercise, or what did you say, Linda? Practice. Right. practice. Yeah, practice. There's other things to practice. It's other other thoughts before we close this morning? Glenn, can you close us in prayer this morning? Your love for us.